So welcome um, to a Kickstarter preview from the playersaid.com. My name is Alexander, and today we're taking a look at Donning the Purple. Um, and this is a it's a ancient Roman themed game, and it, it's a Euro style, almost a it's an action taking, semi cooperative game. Really, it's a competitive game, which is designed for two or three players. Um, but there are some cooperative elements in the sense that there are barbarian hordes coming down on the empire, and if they kind of take over the map, you will all lose the game. So it's in your kind of best interest to try and fend those off, but you want to be the one to benefit from that. So if you do the winning of the battles, you know, you, you'll get a chance to gain some benefits from that, but you might also want to not take that battle on so that the barbarians, barbarians kind of destroy some of your opponent's buildings and, and kind of weaken them. So there's some element of um, co cooperation, but a lot of this game is intrigue and backstabbing and waiting for opportune moments to strike your enemies and maximize the benefits that you'll gain from doing that in a timely manner. So the game plays um, very quickly. I was surprised at how quickly it played because a lot of games tout um, a short play time, but really they lie, well they don't lie, but the games invariably go longer when we play them. This game played in about an hour. Um, maybe a little bit longer with looking at the rules, but it plays very quickly, especially if you've played it a couple of times. And this is a game that you'll want to play over and over again. That's how I decide, you know, if a game is, is really one that I enjoyed is do I want to play it again right afterwards? Because I either learned so much and want to do it again, or it was just that engaging. And this is one where we played it for the first time and it was really cool. There's some really neat mechanics in here and we'll go through those here in just a second. But I had a blast. And after I was done, I was like, oh my gosh, there are so many things I would want to do differently or I would want to explore more or try to execute better to, to kind of do better in the game. And as well, again, with the mechanics, the interplay between um, players and characters, um, it's a game that warrants more players to, to kind of put that to the next level. The game is very dynamic in that way, and what I mean is, is you all do things to actively attack each other, you can assassinate each other in order to use up the throne, because only one player can be the emperor at any given time, and that sounds great, and you do spend all this time and effort plotting to kill the emperor, and you do it, and then you realize that you have an extremely long list of things that you need to do as the Emperor. I mean, it's, it's, it's uncanny how much there is for you to do. Um, you know, as the Pretenders, you just sit there and really what you're trying to do is get money and try and eke out a few victory points, but really you get victory points by being the Emperor. So you're just trying to kill the Emperor. That's really a lot of what you're trying to do and keep your buildings alive by fending off some barbarians. As soon as you become the Emperor, you don't have the responsibility of feeding every single person in the entire Empire, and if not, um, you just won't get any victory points, and you might die, because the people will be unhappy and they'll revolt. The onus is on you to build the legions to fight the barbarians. The Emperor is the only one who can build legions, so if all the legions are dead, uh, pretenders can't do anything, but neither can you, and you'll get swamped and lose the game. On top of that, um, you're also trying to fend off the people who are trying to assassinate you and um, just manage everything else in the Empire. You have the option to kind of choose an heir as well to try and keep the, emp the Emperorship, kind of keep that yours so if you die, you know, you can continue doing that as well as keep the Senate in check. I mean, there's so much to do as the Emperor. You know, it's, it seems great. Oh yeah, I assassinated the Emperor and now I'm the Emperor and you realize it's a lot of responsibility and there's a lot of ways to mess it up and everyone will just gang up on you. And, that's, and, it, and that seems like it's very mean and very take that and to a, a very small extent, sure, that could be that way, but understand that going into it and understand that you'll only be emperor for a little bit. And that's partly because there's a timing mechanic. So the game revolves around you having a player mat and you have some st a bunch of stamina tokens. 10 in a 2 player game and 11 in a 3 player game. And each time you choose an action, you expend a stamina token. And once you've expended all your stamina tokens, 
your character is exhausted, then they die, basically. They've you've expended all of their um, actions, and, and it abstractly represents a lifetime of service and winning key battles. Um, and, and, then what, and then what happens is, you, know, you die, and then if you're the Emperor, you do all this great stuff, but eventually you will die. And, and, and it happens very quickly, I mean, a turn or two at the most. You just, you have so many actions and only have so many stamina tokens. And that, that keeps the, the, like the Emperor moving around the board, it keeps it fresh, so you won't get one player who's going to be the Emperor for four turns in a three-player game, it's just not going to happen. You most likely have two Emperors every turn, just because everyone's backstabbing each other, everyone's dying. There's a, a series of events that happen every turn, and they're all terrible. And we'll go through those and show you some of those, but just calamity after calamity happens. So you're trying to put out a bunch of fires, um, as well as the main barbarian invasions as well, and avoiding famines and building aqueducts. So it seems like there's a lot to do, but the rules themselves, very simple, they're very light, um, but, but understand that, you know, no one's going to sit there and be, and run away with the game, because it's so easy to usurp the throne, and then you grab a few points, and then you get usurped, and it passes around, and it, before that gets old and tired, the game's over. The game is four rounds, so it's actually very, very quick, and that's something I really, really, really enjoyed. And there's a, never a time where you're kind of sat around doing nothing for a long period of time, because a lot of the actions can be copied. You know, the Emperor does this thing, and then you just go around the table, and each one of you can spend stamina and spend coins to do that out of turn as well. So that's great. But again, each time you spend a stamina, you're doing all this copying, but you're putting yourself closer to death as well. And each time you die, you get a negative victory point. At the end of uh, our first game, I think the highest score was... The highest score was 12? We had 12 to 7 in the end. We just played a two-player game the first time. And I feel like that's... Maybe we were very bad at the game. But I felt like that was probably a pretty typical number of victory points. You'd have a very hard time accruing a significant amount more than that. And, and because it's a short game, you, it's, there's so much to do and so much interplay. It was on where I was immediately like, yes, let's do this again. And Grant was... He was like... Let's do it again as well. It, but we both thought, this was awesome. There's so much flavor. And this is a prototype copy we have here of the Kickstarter version, which you're looking at is, is going to be extremely well produced. And I say that because if a prototype copy is extremely well produced, then I know for a fact that the main game is going to be good. They've already put so much into this already. If, if what I have here components-wise, if all they did was the custom glory dice, which I know are going to be on there, and then the player board was a, an actual board, that would be enough. This is all, a, you know, a finished product already. And we'll show you all the components they have and you can see what that looks like. But really, uh, donning the purple was a big hit with us. And um, I, I do love this theme. And um, I have a few games, you know, in this genre, but this is a much, like, a more compact version of those that plays very quickly. So I don't have to sit down for three hours and play Mad Nostrum with five players, because it can take a long one, that one. I love that game, but it's a, it can be a long one. Or, um, it, this is just very quick. You pull it out, it's easy setup, and you play, and it's done. So let me show you the board, and we'll go through a few different bits and pieces of the mechanics so you can see those, and then we'll wrap up, and I'll kind of give you a final hurrah. So here's a look at the board, uh, and kind of all the components. Again, we played a two-player game, and so we've got, um, there's two player boards here. That's kind of the big thing. Uh, with the third player, you would just have one extra board, so really there wouldn't be any more table creep or anything like that. It's a fairly compact, small size game. The board, whilst it being, you know, as small compared to a lot of other Euro games out there, is the perfect size. It didn't feel too crowded, necessarily, apart from in one region where it just, things got out of hand real bad. But there wasn't a lot of stuff, it's not a big messy board or anything like that. And the artwork, is beautiful. And I know that we had a pre-production copy and during the Kickstarter, you know, you'll see um, Stretch Goals is going to show you all of the different things that they can do, but the artwork for what we played is fantastic. And again, not final production quality, but this is uh, excellent indication of what the game will be. I'll be very pleased with how it looks. 
um, the game itself, there, there's a few major things that go on. One is these blue cubes are kind of the, the barbarians and all the various different outside invaders that come in. And you'll roll a die, and the die will say, you know, four. So in province, in the fourth province of each region, because there's these four regions, there's kind of red, green, orange, and blue, and each of those have six provinces within them. In fo province four of each region, you put two cubes. So two cubes go here, two cubes go here, and, and so on. Two cubes are going to go here, that's, that's very bad, and two cubes are going to go down here. And then they all move, and all the barbarians are moving towards these region capitals that have a star. These are kind of the big cities. So they will literally try to move here. Now, there's some kind of rules about army size and value. So these, this is worth two points. I've got a big old army of five. They won't even try to get in. But if I've got, you know, let's, if I only had one dude in here, well, they wouldn't do that. So if I've got one guy in Macedonia, these guys are going to move here. They're going to kill that guy. That's very bad, obviously. And so a lot of the game is trying to build forces and actively go and take out small bands. Because if these two can't get in, they just sit there. Well, next turn, if I roll three and these guys come out, and then they'll move up. Well, now this is four. And if that happens again, you end up with these huge roaming bands of barbarians, which are almost impossible to take out. So you want to put out the small fires before it becomes a furnace. This happened very early in the game. It was terrible. Uh, things went downhill very badly from poor rolls and unlucky events that just put a ton of barbarians out. So we lost, uh, we lost a lot of control here in, uh, in Pontus, it, but that was, it was not good. But that's a really neat aspect. This is the co-op aspect of the game. Everyone's trying to fight off the barbarians, mostly, because the barbarians, if they move into a region with a building, they destroy it. So if they destroy my uh, opponent's buildings, I'm not that worried about it. But, you know, that gets them closer to... Um, taking all the region capitals. And if all region capitals are occupied by bar barbarians, you all lose. So that's neat. There is this co-op aspect. But then you're also just, it's just full of backstabbing and intrigue. So each player has these stamina tokens. And you'll use these on your turn. If you're not the emperor, you, you get three actions. And you'll be using these. Um, it, it's similar to worker placement, but it's really not. You just, it's action selection, I'm going to do this, and I, full, and I, oh, I try this action, and then I'm going to do this one, and then I'm going to build something. And I do each of these actions, then I do another one. And so that reduces how much stamina I have in my unused pool. And then what will happen is, the next turn, I'm going to use more and more and more. Well, if I, ever, if I assassinate the emperor and somehow ascend to the throne, well, I've got very few stamina left. And that leaves me very much open to assassination, because all a player has to do is they spend um, five gold to attempt an assassination. They roll a die, and they roll a three, I lose three stamina. Now, if they roll any higher than that, I would die, and the emperor would then move to a different player based on kind of a hierarchy. But there's an heir token. Whoever's got the heir token would become the next emperor. And failing that, if no one was the heir, whoever controls the Senate in this corner, and the Senate is controlled by the rightmost senator with the highest value, so the green player would become, these are here, the green player is then going to become the, uh, the emperor, because he has the rightmost emperor, mo most senator in the Senate. So there's this, you have to be very careful about if and when you assassinate, because who's going to then become the emperor? Because what you'll, you know, if you have few stamina left, you assassinate the emperor and you become it. Well, you're going to kill yourself doing, you know, you exhaust yourself and you die trying to do some imperial things, and then the emperorship goes to someone else and it's all over for you. So there's some really cool back and forth between how you use your actions versus what you're trying to do if you're trying to ascend to the throne actively to gain the victory points. And victory points are fairly few and far between. In a two-player game, Grant had 12 at the end, and I had, I think I had 8. So it's not a super high-scoring game. And really, you get 
two at the end of the game for controlling the Senate. You get um, a few, if you, you get two if you've built all three of your monuments, which it looks like the Colosseum here. You get, if you build all three of those, you get two victory points. There's some victory points available sometimes on these forum cards, and we'll get here in a second as well. If you have, so this one was if you had the most of your stamina tokens permanently sacrificed on here, you'd get two victory points. But outside of that, the majority of the victory points come from this happiness track. And if, you're, if your happiness is anywhere in this range band, you get one. If it's anywhere here, you get two. Here you get three. Here you get four. If there's 15 happiness, you get five victory points. But only the emperor gets those. And these are divvied out every year. So during the year's end, the emperor would get one victory point. You know, if this is up here, which is difficult to do, it's very difficult to maintain that, they're going to get three victory points just right there and then. Every time you die, you get negative one victory point. And so there's this very, very intense interplay between trying to attack people, trying to gain victory points, and balancing that so that you can actually stay ahead in the game. Because I was the emperor for three out of the four years, racking in victory points for happiness, but I died a few times, so I took negatives from that. And then the final way to gain victory points is through these hidden agenda cards. And everyone gets dealt one of these. And so there's, you, there's two things that you can possibly fulfill to gain victory points. But if you don't fulfill this or you do meet these criteria, then you lose victory points. So that was also another very difficult thing. I, you know, I gained only one victory point even though I should have gotten two. I got a negative from this one. So there's even struggle within what it is that you're trying to do as well. Some of the best parts of the game, though, is your capacity to copy people's actions. If I choose, for example, to bribe a senator, I would pay the, the, kind of, the amount of money on this track. So there's four. I have to pay four, and I can put one of my senators out. Four money doesn't seem like a lot, but it, it can be, depending on where you're at. Then immediately, the next person to the left of me can pay to kind of one-up me. So they could pay five gold to put out one of their senators. And, I, and then I ask myself, why did I just spend money to do that? And then if you have a third player, they can copy as well, and they'll spend six to put their one out. And so you end up with this very expensive kind of dogfight within the Senate to try and get control. Because, again, there's VPs available at the end of the game. But also, if you control the Senate at the, end of the, at the end of the round, or kind of before the production phase, the production line has a bunch of different buildings on it. And we'll get there in just a second. As the, as the controller of the Senate, you can switch the positions of any two of these. In a two-player game, these first three will get built. In a three-player game, the first four will get built. So if your little building sat over here in space five, bully for you, it's not getting built unless you control the Senate, in which case you're like, I'm going to put myself to the front of the line. So my de building's definitely going to get built, and I'm going to screw another player out of their building getting built. So there's this, so the Senate's got a lot of very subtle power that, that gets, can, can get you ahead, which is very nice. Your buildings get built, so you choose where those get placed. There are mainly two types of buildings. Um, you have your monuments, which just gain you a, a permanent bonus to your character through strength or die rolling. Or you have these um, estates, and these gain you money during the tax phase. If you have these out on the board, you get five gold for each one that you have. And that's the only way for you to get money if you're not the emperor. If you're the emperor, you gain one gold for each province not occupied by barbarians. So typically, we were getting 20 gold as the emperor, plus whatever estates you had out. So you could end up with you know, 30, 35 gold each round. That's fairly nice. But as the emperor, you've got to spend that money. You've got to build legions, which cost two apiece to fight the battles. And then you have to feed your people. And there's some, there's some neat mechanics about farming. If there's famines, your farms don't generate food, and there's some other different bits and pieces. You, the emperor can build aqueducts to protect those regions from famine for the future. 
So we had a few of those out, and that also increases happiness because everyone's got clean sanitary water. Um, but that is a huge money drain for the emperor. So once you're getting all this taxation in, you have to spend it to keep the people happy for you to garner the victory points. And so there's a, there's a lot of responsibility, so to speak, as the emperor. As, as the pretender, you just sit there just plotting. And that's all you do, and it's so cool. Because the, the onus is not on you to necessarily win the game. Um, you just have to sit there and wait for the opportune time to strike, to kind of swoop in and take victory points and make the best of a bad situation that the Emperor might be in. The combat itself, we'll talk about that here, is it's very simple, like we said. So your, your legions have strength value, and the barbarians do, and you move around. Whoever's got the highest strength, you just get rid of them. Only the Emperor can move legions. So as the pretender, you just sit there, you don't do that. But the Emperor has to spend um, the, their stamina to move these and actively fight off the barbarians. Your player pawn, you can move, can also fight. This has a strength of two, but you can bump it up with some uh, bonuses, which we'll get to. Um, so he can go in and he could fight off smaller armies and kill those. But really, the power is in the legions, and the emperor holds that power. The cool thing is, is when you, um, when you defeat, so if these five legions defeat four barbarians, you gain a happiness, so that's nice. But the really cool bit is you roll glory dice. And uh, in the Kickstarter, you'll see that they have um, custom glory dice. We just use D6s with a chart. You roll these, and based on what you get, typically you get a lot of money. So this is going to generate, um, this would, well, this would have generated 13 gold. You just gain 13 gold. If you ever roll ones, you get to draw a plot card. And we'll get here in just a second. And the plot cards are very, very powerful, give you bonuses or special events. If you roll a six, that's the only bad result. So one side of these glory dice, you lose a stamina for each um, six that you roll, each of those stamina um, icons that show up. So that's very bad. So there's some risk-reward there. You know, you do a big combat. It could go very poorly based on what you do. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at the plot cards. So we've got a big deck of these, and these are really, really nice cards. Um, so what they do is they have an event on them that you can just play during your turn. It's kind of, it's not an action, it's just a free thing you can do. You can move the air from anywhere to your player mat free of charge. It's very, very powerful. Normally you can only buy the air from, you know, buy it once, and it costs 15 gold. This you can do it free. And some of these, so you can receive money, or you can remove food from the grain storage. So you can either gain money or you can hurt the emperor, which that's a big deal. Um, this is, you can move the price of grain up or down one space. So the emperor will never have enough food from his farms, so he has to import some. And you can hamstring the emperor making him pay, you know, three or four gold for each um, food that he has to buy. Or you can make it cheaper for yourself if you happen to be the emperor. So there's some give and take there. Or, so that's kind of the main idea of the plot cards. But what you can do is use them here for the strength bonus. There's a strength bonus in the bottom right-hand corner. Usually anywhere from two, two, three, or four is what they are. And that strength bonus can be used in a few different ways. You can play this um, when you're attacking. So you can add plus two. So my pawn is a normally a two. I can add plus two. And then if I move into here where there's three... I can kill those all and succeed and win the battle. Great. Or, if I'm moving legions as the emperor, I've got five. I can also add to that value using one of these. I've got plus four to that. That's great. But really, to me, the important part of these is you can protect yourself from assassination. Assassination is deadly in this game. Uh, to, kill the, to kill the emperor, you need to roll that dice, and you're trying to get a high number to remove all of their unused stamina so that they would then die. What I do beforehand is I secretly play, well, I play a plot card face down, and this is going to add to my total, to whatever I roll. So I've, I add a plus two, but then the defender has the option to play as many as they want. So they're going to play a negative four, uh, uh, well, 
it's a plus four, but for the defender it adds as a subtractive. So we're going to roll the dice. I rolled a two. Plus two is four. Well, my defense card was a plus four, which negates all of this four. So it's a net wash. So I spent all that money, and I actually don't do any damage to the emperor. He successfully counters my plot. And so you end up with this really fun economy of these very, very expensive and quite rare cards. And it's this give and take of, oh, do I do the cool event, or do I hold off to protect myself, or do I ensure that I'm going to kill the emperor? And you can use these to assassinate um, senators as well, but assassinating a, assassinating a senator, a lot of siblings there, is much easier. You would roll a die on a two through six, you would kill a senator. And so modifying that is, to me, unless you were in like a key position and that was going to net you a win, that's when you would expend those. But really, the senators are up for, there's a lot of assassination that goes on in the Senate, a lot of killing that happens there. But those are the plot cards, those are really cool. I, that's part of, the best part of the game is you get this great intrigue there of this really tight economy and when to use them. The events happen every, every year, the Emperor is going to draw five event cards and you just do them one by one and they're all mostly terrible for you. So this one's a, it's an earthquake. You roll a d4 to decide which of those colored regions, and then all this bad stuff happens. All the buildings are removed, it goes into a famine, and if you have your player pawn there, you lose two stamina. That's terrible. That's honestly terrible. This one, your rivals are doing well. Everyone except for the emperor rolls two glory dice and gets the, gets the rewards. This is enemy movement. You get is just extra enemy movement. That's terrible. This one's grain shortage, there's rats going to eat all of your um, grain, and there's a ton of these. And, and again, I know this is pre-production, but the, the artwork on these is so good. I really enjoy these, I think they're great. They just give you a good theme, and they, it's just a great looking game. Simple, not too much in the way of clutter and small texture or anything like that. Just gives you great flavor as these come up. And they just... It's, they're savage. You, you just roll with the punches and it's trying to stamp out all the fires. The last thing that we have here are these um, forum cards. So one of these is going to come out each turn and this just adds an extra place to put your stamina tokens on your turn. As an action, you can move X stamina from your used circle to your unused circle. So I'm going to permanently spend one here and then I can move three used stamina I gain three health back, basically. And a, lo a lot of them are like that. You permanently spend one stamina to gain 10 gold, or one stamina to get 20 gold. So, you know, you start doing the expensive ones, and then the actions get worse, but you might be desperate. And there's a few of these, and just adds a bit, a bit of different ways, especially for the pretenders to kind of get in the game and, and mess with the rules a bit more. And lastly... Well, I guess we talk, spoke about the hidden agendas, but everyone gets dealt one of these at the beginning of the game. And it's a case of you're trying to do this secretly and then just whip out some bonus points at the end. And these might kind of help you have a direction at the beginning of the game of what it is you're trying to do. Am I trying to accrue a ton of money? Am I trying to get a ton of happiness? Am I trying to build all of my estates and monuments? Just to give it a little bit of focus in the early game as well when it can seem like there's just... You know, it's early days, what do I do? So that's a lot of, that's pretty much everything in Donning the Purple. Again, this is a, a really fun game, uh, but we're going to wrap up with some final thoughts here. So those were kind of the core mechanics. Um, we had a few mic issues, so I apologize for the sound quality there. But and you can probably tell, I really, really enjoyed this game. I know Trumpet Games have, I think they had one other game, which is a more abstracted looking tactical style um, fortress assault game. This one is a, probably a bit more mainstream uh, in, in its appeal. I think a lot of people are going to like this and I think they're going to like it because it's really easy to learn. The rules book is... So the rules book originally Norwegian, Trumpet Games Norwegian Company, they were still, the rules were written very very well. Um, the only thing was the plot cards you don't get many of them. It's very hard to get those. So that was a much tighter economy than I initially thought. I thought, oh, I'll just use it and we'll get more, blew more in the first round and then didn't have any. And, and that, that was 
not good. You want to keep those for really opportune times to maximize your attack or defense or that really powerful kind of event ability that goes on with those. That's the only thing that I was like, ah, oh, no. But really outside of that, the game was very intuitive as well. And that's why it's easy to learn. Barbarians come in, you gotta fight off the barbarians. How do you do that? Emperor, please build us some legions. And then you, you fight you fight off them, the barbarians. You know, we have to feed everyone. We've got X amount of food. We have to raise money to get that. And the, the emperor gets tax money, but but is it, is it enough? And do I do my best to try and increase the price of the grain to try and bankrupt the emperor? And there's just, there's just so much cool stuff going on. I liked the Senate. In a three-player game, the Senate is a dogfight, and it's a money sinkhole and very expensive. And I loved that that added this element to the game where, especially if you're not the Emperor, and you have a few limited actions, the fighting over the Senate is, it can be savage. And there's just always stuff to do, and those forum cards that come out that change the rules and give you things like, do I permanently sacrifice those stamina to gain those really helpful abilities? They're just so much compacted into what is a very small game. And that's, that's what I love. I think it's a very well-made, well-produced game, and I think you guys are gonna love it. Um, I would I'll back this thing on Kickstarter, and uh, you're gonna have a great game delivered. Great final production, I can almost guarantee that based on what we've got here, but the game itself, it is very much worth investing in. So this has the uh, Player's Aid seal of approval, I'm gonna say, and thanks for watching. And go ahead, Matt, donning the purple from Trumpet Games.